Uh, pleasure to have you here, traders. Um, in this mentoring session, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, day trading gaps. Um, you probably know that that would be my main strategy, but you know, before I start with that, I just want to tell you something very important about having your own strategy. You know, I developed my strategy on how to trade gaps throughout the years. Uh, it's not something that you do overnight. It's something that uh, takes years to come out with a strategy. Actually, a trader should have several strategies. You know what? Most traders I know don't have more than uh, five strategies on average, something that they specialize in, something that they feel comfortable with, something that they do by themselves. Before I continue and explain about my strategy, which is not really my strategy because a lot of traders do the same thing all over around the world, so it's not really my invention. Uh, I do take it and I do tweak it a little bit, but um, and, and make it ready for me to make it um, you know as, as appropriate for me as possible. But you know it's it's something that every trader around the world does develop their own strategies, and many of the traders around the world have strategies that have to do with gap trading. Now, why is that? Because gaps are extremely volatile. So you want to have in one of your strategies at least one of your strategies has to do with gaps. In fact, there are many types of gap strategies. Strategies. Now, before I get into the gap strategy, the one I want to talk about today, I want to mention a thing that is extremely important here. If you do not develop your own strategy, you're doomed. You don't have a chance to survive. And what do I mean by that? You know, we're trading in the trading room. There's several of us uh, traders, there's several analysts, there's several um, experienced traders in the room. If you're just here to follow us and you're starting out, you're doing the right thing. Because if you're just starting out, if you're a novice trader and you want to look for a strategy or develop your own strategy and you are basing it on some kind of knowledge that we can give you, for example, you follow my trade, you follow Scott's trades, Dennis trade, Yogi's trade, whoever, and then you develop your own strategy based on that, that's fine. But if you just keep following us and do whatever we do, you will never survive. You can't survive. Uh, jumping in between strategies. You can see something very interesting in the trading room. You, you, you can see that uh, what we do uh, is different between, uh, every trader has a different way of trading. I rarely take Scott's trades, he rarely takes mine. I mean, maybe on an average, uh, once every two days, I will take one of Scott's trades or he will take mine. Why is that? He specializes on his strategies. I specialize on mine. So. When I'm getting into a trade, I know exactly when to click the button. I'm, I'm flying with this trade. I know exactly when to get in. I know exactly when to get out. I don't have to think about it. I do, but it, it's, it's something which is in my nature. It's something that I understand. So you see, if you want to develop something, you need to develop your own strategy. You can't just copy strategies of other traders. I've seen traders who just copy strategy for the rest of their life. They will never be successful because you need to have one, two, three to start with and then tweak it and work with it and, and, and you know, adapt it to your needs and to the way that you trade. So if you are with us in the trading room, you need to understand that our job is to provide you with the basics of what we do, but in order for you to develop your own strategy, in order to survive trading, otherwise you're just not going to make it. Seriously, you need to, divide, to, to, to come out with your own. So why should I teach you about the strategy that I'm using personally right now if I don't expect it to be your main strategy or whatever? That is because some parts of what I'm going to teach you today could be a part in your future strategy. And again, that's my job, to give you... A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and to come to the point where you understand what I do better and then maybe take it and adapt it to your needs. And your needs are probably much different than mine. You don't have the same amount of money. Maybe you have more, maybe you have less in your bank, in, in your trading account. Uh, you're, you're mentally built a little bit different than I am. Uh, some people are, you know, uh, like to take more risk or less risk. So you see, or trade early, or trade later, five minute candles, one minute candles, whatever. My strategies can only give you some kind of basic idea of what I do. I'm going to get a little bit more into details now, but that should, that should be your starting point to build your own strategy. So I, was, I hope I was clear on that. I hope, uh, uh, I hope it makes sense to you. 
um, and um, and that uh, you know um, you could do something with the, with what we're going to learn today. Okay, so with that said, uh, let's start. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, trading gaps today, and specifically, I'm going to talk about trading uh, gap and goals. But before I talk about gap and goals, I want to show you uh, the basic gap strategy, with, which is, in fact, gap close strategy. You know, most gaps are getting closed. When I say most gaps, I would say 80% of gaps are getting closed, or at least stock is moving in the direction of closing the gap. So look at the example you're seeing here. Uh, this is from today, five minute candles. CCL started with a gap down approximately 1%. And as you can see, the first move was up. At that point over here, it closed the gap. It continued a little bit higher. And as something that uh, normally happens when the get gap is getting closed, changed direction and came down. Now, uh, that would be the main gap strategy traders use. Why? It's very easy to do. It's normally activated on five minute candles. You can see the first five minute candle down, second a reversal candle, third a very clear technical reversal. You can go long over the highs or even before that and you can target uh, the place where the stock closes the, uh, close the gap. A uh, very easy strategy to work with. Most people prefer that. Uh, I'm going to talk to you now about gap and goes, which is the exact opposite, a gap that opens down and then the stock continues down, or a gap that opens up and then the stock continues up. That's a gap close strategy, which is more common, simpler to use, and I'm not going to talk much about it today. I mean, just the basic idea you need to understand, the rhythm that uh, most gaps are getting closed, and I'm talking now about gaps up to 3% and the smaller the better. Like this one, for example, is 1%. So the, the smaller the gap, the more likely it's going to get closed. The reason for gaps to get closed is not you and I as traders helping it to close the gap, it's institutional traders. Institutional traders are closing gaps. The reason they're closing gaps is because they are hired by someone to buy large quantity of stocks. In fact, institutional traders are 80% of the volume of the stocks that we're trading. So if an institutional trader who's ordered to buy CCL finds out in the morning the CCL starts with a gap down of 1%, he is buying it until the point where the gap is closed. The reason he's buying it is because he's getting extra commission from his customer, his, the same customer who asked him to buy the stock and... Uh, uh, therefore pays in commission. Normal commission would be around three cents. Extra commission could be another 10 cents. So the institutional buyer who's buying now below yesterday's closing price, which means commission, is getting extra commission. That's why the stock's moving up and closing the gap. That's 80% of the volume, remember, comes from institutional traders. That's why they are in the game. That's why we're following them. That's why gaps are getting closed. Now, I'm not getting into this into inside this into details, but you need to understand the main force in closing gaps is institutional traders. So having that said, CCL gap close is due to institutional traders. Why did all of these four trades didn't work out the same way? Why did ANF start with a gap down, try to move higher and failed? Why did uh, DLTR start with a gap down, try to move higher and failed? Why did ADSK start with a gap down, try to move higher and failed? Why did Wright start with a gap up, moved higher, try to move lower and continue higher? I, I would call it fail to close the gap, right? So all of them failed to close the gap. They did not fail as a trade. I mean, they moved the right way. They moved the way, I, the direction I wanted them. I'm not showing you what happened later. I mean, I don't care about what happened later. I only want you to see what happened during the first one hour because that's the time of the gap and go. Whatever comes later, I'll be out of the trade. But the gap and go system works best during the first one hour and usually starts quite early. It starts like in the first two, three, five minutes. So sometimes you get a chance to trade it with five minute candles. Sometimes you don't. So since if, if you're concentrating on these kind of trades, then normally it will be a uh, it will be a gap and go during the first uh, uh, during the first few um, few minutes, and you will need one minute candles. Now let me take up um, uh, ADSK here. Uh, 
Hold on a second. I want to get to this point where we see what happened during the first few minutes. Okay, then. Uh, we're watching ADSK in one minute candles. ADSK started down, I believe that was a little bit more than 7%. Now, what's the story of a gap and go? Well, the first idea is to take a look at the gap and see that we have a very, very big gap. Um, I will prepare to this trade pre-market time. So pre-market time, I will go over my top 20. It is in my Comex platform. I will go over the top 20 and I will just take a look. Actually, it's not top 20 anymore. It's big movers, big gappers. And I will take a look and I will find all the stocks that are starting with a gap, uh, with a big gap. I mean, 2% is fine. I would just make different lists. One list is the one, two, three percent. They could move up and close the gap. But then will be the, the, the list of the stocks uh, which starts down over three percent. That would be a little bit more rare. And and having a stock that is gapping down six, seven, or ten or twenty percent would be even more rare. Okay? But I'll make the list of these stocks. Uh, and today I didn't find a lot. I mean, I had the, 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 the same four I showed you here. There may have been one or two more. There were. Uh, I, I just forgot uh, symbols right now. And some of them were a little bit too spready or whatever. So I was watching them. But I was preparing pre-market time. In fact, I find them approximately anywhere between one hour pre-market to 30 minutes pre-market. I would make my list. But this list is not on paper. It actually comes on one of my charts. So I would have like 20, actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 25 different, uh, I think it's 20, yeah, 25 different charts. Uh, about uh, half of them, a little bit more, would be short candidates, uh, the big gappers, and then the smaller gappers, and some of them would be uh, long candidates. Uh, big gappers, small gappers, whatever. So I'll be looking pre-market time for stocks which are uh, likely to become very volatile today. I'll put them on charts and then I have my main four charts, which I just showed you. Uh, the main four charts that I have on my screen are the ones that I'll be looking to trade during the first few minutes. So I'm preparing with the, the, the whole group of stocks that I'm watching today and I'll be, I will be preparing as well for the stocks that I will be trading. Those comes on the main four charts and for each of these charts I have uh, the level two and the time and sale. So I'm really prepared to trade this for, for uh, uh, trade. So one of them, my first trade today was ADSK. So uh, right out of the gate, uh, I knew ADSK is going to start with a big gap down pre-market time. You, you could see that. Uh, of course, things could change, but it started with a big gap down. So it started with a big gap down. The first move was up. That would be the perfect technical formation. Well, before I move into that, let me just say the following. You, you remember we talked earlier about gap getting closed and institutional traders are closing the gap and uh, why are they closing the gap because they're getting extra commission. I did not get into the details. I would like to explain some other time uh, the whole uh, idea of why the gaps are getting closed and what exactly happens with institutional traders. Now you just have to trust me. They are the ones who are closing the gaps. They are 80% of the volume. We are only trading, I mean, I am only trading stocks over $10 and over 1 million share in volume daily. The reason for that is because institutional traders uh, are not involved in stocks under $10. Well, 90% of them are not involved with stock under $10 and they only need to, and they need to see large volume. So over $10, over 1 million shares, that's kind of okay. That's a little bit marginal for the institutional traders. The more the volume, there will be more institutional traders. So higher volume, over $10, they will be there. And they will be 80% of the volume. So if they are working their way up, closing the gap, or down if it's a gap up and they are shorting, no, excuse me, they're not shorting, they're selling. Institutional traders don't short. So if they are buying or they are selling and then the gap is getting closed, that would be something that they will often do and that would make it uh, uh, normally uh, a very high uh, likelihood for the gap to get closed. And again, you can trade it, but we're not talking about this kind of gaps right now. So why do I expect ADSK instead of going up and closing the gap to gap and go to come down? The reason for that is quite simple. And if you have any question, please write them down. I am looking on both sides, YouTube uh, uh, comments and uh, <laughs> our training room comments here. So if you have any question, if you have any remark to make, please write it down and I'll try and stop it once in a while and ask uh, and, and, and uh, 
and uh, answer your questions. So yeah, please write them down. Okay, so uh, why do I expect ADSK to come down? Why wouldn't it move up the same reason like CCL earlier did and uh, you know move it up and close the gap? The reason for that is really uh, quite simple. Uh, institutional traders are buying or selling stocks instructed by their customers. So it could be a big fund who told um, Goldman Sachs to buy CCL, 1 million shares. Well, they're not buying 1,000 shares. It doesn't move billions of dollars of the funds and so on. So they will buy large quantity of shares. Now, uh, if they are instructed to buy, let's say there's an institutional trader who's instructed to buy uh, 1 million shares of ADSK. Uh, ADSK, last few days, were going sideways, it was fine, nothing was wrong, and the same institutional traders, let's say Goldman Sachs, who was instructed to buy 1 million shares, uh, started doing their job. So they bought 100,000 uh, the day before, and then yesterday they bought another 100,000. They can't buy too many at one at a time, because then they will drive the price out up, and that means they'll get fired and no commission, and no extra commission, and <laughs> you know what commission means for, for people who are traders. So anyway, uh, they are instructed to buy ADSK. 80% of the volume in ADSK comes from institutional traders. So again, stock starts with the gap down, it's under yesterday close. Theoretically, there should be some extra commission because the institutional trader could buy it right there at a very low price, and then the price will go up. No. Normally in the agreements between the institutional traders and their customers, let's say a fund, there will be the 3% close. The 3% close means the following. Now it doesn't have to be exactly 3%, it's normally around 3%. The 3% says the following. If a stock, whatever, we have an agreement, I'm gonna buy you 1 million shares of ADSK. If the stock gaps up or down more than 3%, stop buying or stop selling. Because remember, 80% of the volume in ADSK means 80% are also buyers and also sellers. It's not just buyers. But I'm talking about the buyers right now because it's under yesterday's low. So the buyers look at ADSK. Institutional traders don't care, but they have an agreement. And the agreement says, don't buy. Why? Well, you have to remember that the, the customer who's buying the stock, let's say, again, a fund somewhere, He's interested in buying 1 million shares of ADSK because they believe ADSK would move higher. They are mostly fundamental thinking. They're not thinking about the technical analysis here. They have, a, they, they have analysts, they have uh, advisors, and the advisor said, well, we think ADSK should do well. So anyway, they started buying ADSK and all of a sudden it gets down 7%. Wow, stop. Then comes kick, kicks in the 3% rule. Stop now. Stop right now. Why can't you buy ADSK? Because it gets down more than 3%. Something's going on. We don't want you to continue buying. You bought 200,000 out of 1 million. Stop. Stop right now. We need to see what's going on in ADSK. I mean, what happened there? Again, fundamental thinking. They, they, are, they, they have enough power normally they have enough power to call the CFO of ADSK uh, call the chief financial officer of the ADSK and ask what happened please explain okay we're not married we're too much let's continue buying they will come to a decision like in a week from now they will have a they will have a sit down with uh, Goldman Sachs and, or, and with their advisors and they will, they will discuss well, okay ADSK gap down 7% what shall we do we're certainly not buying it right now at the open Let's sit down a week from now and decide what we're going to do with ADSK. Maybe at the end of the day, maybe in a few hours. Definitely not now. So stock is gapping down, 3% close, kicks in, no institutional traders. Well, not exactly right. Uh, th there may be some who are still instructed to continue buying. So you can, I, I can't really say 100% no, but let's just think now that if earlier we had 80% institutions and 20% traders, actually not traders, investors, because in the 20% group, we are a very small part, you know, just, just, just a fraction of the 20%. The 20% are more like Warren Buffett's, uh, not him, I mean, people who think like Warren Buffett, long-term investors, swing traders, and of course, some traders. So we are in the 20%, okay? Now, the, it changes. Now, we're probably like 80%, I mean, we, long-term investors and traders. Now we are probably like 80% and institutional buyers or sellers are now probably around 20%. 
And again, some of them will continue, some of them will have clear instructions to continue buying ADSK or whatever reason. I don't care, I don't know. But the vast majority now is going to be people like us, normal people, people who fear, people who greed. <laughs> and that's where fear and greed kicks into the equation. So now I have to stop thinking about institutional traders. I have to start thinking about who? I have to start thinking about us, about normal people. So this is where it becomes a little bit more complicated because now we're talking about people. We're not talking about clear black and white rules like the institutional traders. You know, institutional traders, again, you can read them clearly because they sign the book and you know what they're doing. You know what they're doing. You need to know what they're doing. If you're, not, if you're a trader, you need to know what they're doing. And then you can follow or you can expect the next move. So what happens when stock is gaping up in ga down, let's say down, and, and then we talk about the stock that gapped up. What happens if the stock is gaping down in a big way like ADSK? Well, let's talk about the people who held it yesterday or uh, several months ago. You know what? Let's take a look at uh, the daily of ADSK. Here's the daily of ADSK. As you can see, uh, it's rather strong, right? I mean, it was moving higher recently. And uh, here's the last one year. It broke out nicely recently. It, it's rather strong. So most people, think about the investor now. Forget about you. Forget about traders. Think about the investors. So what would most people do? So they love it. Uh, for whatever reason, they believe uh, it's going to move higher because they are fundamentally thinking. And all of a sudden, their beloved stock gaps down 7%. They still believe in it. It's like your football team. Do you, do, do you have a football team? Which one do you support? Write it down in the comments if you like. Anyway, it's like your football team. So it lost. So it lost the last three games. It lost the last five games. Do you still support it? Of course you do. Will you keep buying a DSK? It's like your football team. Of course you do. You support it. Stock is down 7%. You believe the world of it. You told all of your friends that it's a great company. You were right. It was trending higher. And you bought it yourself. And now it's down 7%. So, maybe I'll buy some more. Maybe I'll double down. People do that. They do this huge mistake. You know, when the stock is gapping down 7%, it gaps down for a reason. And it's probably going to continue. It's not going to stop right here. It's, um, I bet you it's going to continue. When I say I bet you it's going to continue, it's because it's very likely to continue. It's because 70% of the time it will continue coming down. But there is the 40% or the 30% that it will stop here and come up, which is less likely. Okay, it's more likely to continue coming down. So buying it, buying a falling knife or catching a falling knife is, a, is, is, is something you're not supposed to be doing. And there are, of course, people who are averaging down their loss. So think about recently the stock moved higher. People were buying. Most people buy at the top. You know this thing where everybody tells you ADSK is such a great company until you make a decision. It's already sky high and then you buy and then it falls. You know that. You've been there, right? So anyway, uh, these people are averaging down their losses. Uh, so let's let's go back to uh, the intraday and uh, see what happened uh, today with uh, ADSK at the beginning of the trading session, which is right over here. Okay, right over here. So at first, the buyers kick in. I don't really know if they're going to kick in at first. Normally, they will come in the first five or ten minutes. They do that. I mean, as a rule, they do that. But they're likely to fail. They're likely to fail because fear is much bigger than greed. And when the stock is moving up, it accumulates some more buyers. But then the people who already decided to buy or people who had automatic buying orders because the stock just fell uh, to their entry point, they are the ones who are likely to get out of the game. They are the ones who are likely to lose. Again, likely. It doesn't always happen like that. But if it happens 70% of the time like that, then you can probably make money. That's what I do. So you want to see them buying. You want to see it moving higher. That would be the perfect technical formation. There are some other technical formations I'll show you, I'll show you soon. But you want to get in after the failure of the buyer. If you don't see a failure of the buyer, 
Well, then it becomes a little bit more tricky. In fact, it becomes much more tricky at that point. It becomes much more uh, dangerous at that point. So you look at ADSK, it starts with a big gap down. Institutional traders are out of the game. They're not going to drive the stock higher. They are just sitting on the fence waiting now. So the, the ones who are buying, again, those private individuals who are buying, and some of them institutional traders could be, uh, are buying. And then you, the only thing you need to look at is a nice technical formation for a reversal. Now, normally, when a reversal like this comes, that would be the reversal. I mean, just imagine now that I'm, I'm just going to theoretically paint it. I mean, you know what? I do have a painter. I don't think I ever used it here. No, okay. Let's leave it. So anyway, uh, just imagine this. Stock starts moving higher, comes down, and then imagine an uptrend. Now it moves to a new high. And then comes down a new high. Just imagine that this pullback here could be just a small pullback in order for the stock to start moving higher. So normally, if you are planning to go long, what you should see is a pullback up to 61.8%, the Fibonacci pullback. And at that point, you could start thinking about buying. You look for a small reversal and then you start buying. But the thing is, when the stock is gapping up in a big way, like ADSK down 7% today, you do not expect the pullback to take you back to the highs. You expect the pullback to show you the high of the day. That's how it normally is. And that would work 70% of the time. Because again, the buyers would usually move out. And then what kicks in is the real fear. And the fear would take it under the lows and more. That would be your trade. What comes next? I don't know. I moved out. I had a stop somewhere. I don't remember. I think it was 3.15. I had a stop for the rest of my quantity. Anyway, I was out. ADSK came down because of the fear, mainly because of the fear and because there's no institutional traders out there and because the buyers were just there for a short while until the stock finally uh, came down again because uh, fear rules. Now, if I'm going to show you uh, the rest of my trades today, you can see that things were quite similar uh, with DLTR and ANF. Let's talk about ANF here. The first move in ANF, again, one minute candles, was down. Very disappointing. When I saw this today, I was extremely disappointed. I mean, I was watching ANF first candle, second candle, third candle. It was coming down. I was disappointed. I mean, ANF started 11% down, I believe, something like that. It started down. It was one of my main candidates. And it was just going down without uh, the buyers moving in. So then I saw that. Then the buyers came in. But just remember, if the stock is just coming down, you cannot participate. Not, I mean, it could clearly continue moving lower. But at some point during the first 10 minutes, normally, the buyers will come in. Those uh, the people who are bottom fishing, the people who are averaging down their lows, they would normally come in at some point. And you need that. So when I was watching NF coming down initially and I was trading ADSK, I was happy with ADSK. I thought, well, I'm missing this trade. And then it stopped and moved up very nicely. Now, the way that it moved up suggests that those buyers who probably thought that the gap will close or uh, they can buy it at a lower price or they're just averaging their losses, they thought it's going to continue moving higher. And then comes the topping tail and again just a technical formation first sign of a pullback that then at some point here you can short it so if you want to short it you can definitely short it somewhere around here to and expect it to continue coming down and that was the trade in ANF I also added once it broke down on the lows which was a good thing to do because it continued coming down and once it broke down under the lows it gave me the uh, um, it gave me the confirmation that I needed to know about uh, the fact that uh, it's not going to come back up, not during the first few minutes anyway. So it came down, added once it came down on the lows and, and continued. The only thing you need to look for is the buyers to come in, uh, stock that is starting with a gap down, 
non-institutional traders, uh, buyers who would normally come in, like most of the time they will come in, and they did come in ANF, a nice technical reversal, look for the technical reversal, short the stock, it's likely to continue coming down. Don't expect this technical reversal here to take it up to the highs again. That would be rare, that would be losing trade for me because I would expect it to come down. And again, fear works much better than greed. That's the reason you always have to wait for a first pullback, see the reversal, and then go short somewhere and uh, look for, uh, uh, for your target. Uh, there's another thing I want to talk about here. Um, I'll read your questions first. But let's just say your entry point is uh, 35.50. Uh, which I believe is the right entry point. I can't remember which was mine really today, but right now looking at it, I think 35.50 would be the right entry point for a short. Let's let's discuss that for a second. But before that, are there any uh, questions? Entry point, yeah, I'm just uh, talking about that right now. Um, hedge funds, yes, of course, hedge funds, Leo, short stocks. Uh, not all of them. Not all of them, but uh, I would say most of them, they do short stocks, but they are uh, not the main uh, volume. Uh, they are uh, relatively very small volume compared to uh, the big funds. They are the smaller players out there. So yes, they do short, but uh, uh, most of the volume comes from institutional traders and I'm not talking about hedge funds now. Uh, entry point, yes, we're talking about that. What if buyers cover... 50% of the gap and after a failure, what would you do? Okay, uh, good point. Um, I, I, I didn't want to get into this detail right now, but since you, you ask it, uh, I, I will answer. Uh, if you look at uh, ANF and ANF doesn't stop right here and just continues over the highs and covers approximately 50% of the gap, don't mess around with this trade. You can mess around, I mean, short it, not here. You can short it somewhere where it closes the gap. It's likely to close the gap and then come down. If you remember earlier, we watched uh, CCL. That would be exactly like CCL. Again, look at CCL. Uh, don't short it as it goes higher. Wait until the gap is closed. Look for a reversal and then short it. That would be the best way to do uh, if you're trading a stock like uh, CCL. But it, it does happen sometime for a big gap that it continues higher. Uh, if it moves up, uh, around 50%, it has something's going on. I mean, it, 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 it has an upside momentum. Don't mess around with it. It was a good point to mention, and that's the rule. Um, how would you find your Gapper stocks at the start of the day? Uh, team, I have it in my Colmex platform. Are you trading Colmex or TFS? You, you, you also have it there. So just just look, look for that. I mean... It's there. And there are some other platforms, of course, that shows that. Big pre-market movers. Uh, you can probably find it on some websites. I just don't need to. Um, Aaron asks, uh, hi, Mayor. Uh, when it breaks down under the lows, uh, do you add? Depends. I'll talk about it. It breaks down or you wait for another pullback. Everything is possible here, Aaron. Uh, you know, it... it you know, I have to say this, not all trades are created equally. Sometimes I look at the market, the market's coming down and I, I feel like I have the, I, the market's helping me. So that could cause me to add. Okay, so how much do I add now? 50% of the initial quantity, double my size. You know, it depends also on the stock. Is it very volatile? Is it spreading? Is it this? You know, I have to trust the technical formation. Do I like the technical formation? Do I, the market working? There's no really clear black and white rule here, but, and, and I don't always add, okay? So it has to do with, with how much I like the trade. Uh, Zuhair, uh, when preparing for your trade, gap and go strategy, uh, do you check the daily? Yes, I do. Uh, check the extender for downside and upside. Yes, absolutely. It's a very good point. You know, uh, let's take a look at ANF here. Uh, let's take a look at the daily. When you take a look at uh, ANF daily, let's move to 12 month here. Okay. Uh, what you can see is uh, the entry point right over here. The entry point right over here suggests the following. It's a good point you just mentioned. Okay, I'm going to draw the line here. That's a line of entry, okay? That's a line of entry. You need to take a look at the last six months or so, and what you're seeing with ANF is that most people bought it higher than the price that it gapped down today. So if you look at the last six months, you can see that most people bought it somewhere over here, 
over our entry point. We shorted it right there. So once we shorted it, at that point, most of the people here were disappointed buyers. If you have most people disappointed, disappointed buyers, it's more likely to come down stronger. Look at the daily and ask yourself, who are most of the people who recently bought it? The, the, the people who recently bought it are people who bought it higher than today's price. Now, if the gap would have been somewhere over here, somewhere over here, and it just moved to a new high, and then gap down, well, people could still live with that because, you know, they still, most of them bought it 5% lower. It's, it's again, it, it's the mental, uh, it, you need to think about the mental um, uh, status of the people who are holding it at that point. Uh, what do they think? If most of them bought it higher, then it's more likely to come down. Uh, if it's more likely to come down, maybe you should uh, trade it with more size, for example. Okay, so <laughs> you see where I'm going. It, it all has to do, it, it, there's a lot of things to, to think about here. Um, did we have more questions here? Did I miss any of your questions? Uh, can you predict the volume of a stock before market is? Yes, I can. Uh, you watch the volume pre-market time and you normally want to see over 30,000 shares pre-market time, like one hour before the trading session is open. And when the trading session is open, you kind of want to see more than 40, 50,000 shares. I, I, I cannot predict, I cannot predict it, uh, but I can definitely, I can definitely uh, hope to see it. Uh, um, I, 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 when I see a lot of volume, I can, I can, I can believe that it's likely to have a lot of volume. Yogi, you're giving us money. Seriously, we're supposed to be paying you on YouTube. <laughs> Yogi probably earned too much today. Uh, depending on the time of stock, your follow the market. On sector um, okay uh, that, that's a complicated uh, answer here uh, mark but yes of course uh, you could uh, definitely depending on the way you trade you can definitely prefer some sectors uh, some some uh, some stocks that you like trade better or so on but that's you know I could get into this for an hour right now but the answer is yes I do prefer but it depends on the gap if there's a big gap like over five percent I would disregard the sector. No, I will not disregard the sector. Like if it's going to be a crypto company or something like that, different issue. If it's a Chinese company, sometimes different issue. If it's a big company, like you don't want to see, um, let's say IBM gets down 5%. It's not the same as ANF does that. Uh, more people would like to buy IBM for the long term. So when IBM gets down 5%, well, I'll be careful. Because, you know, it could just gap and close and move higher. Uh, when ANF gaps down, it's a big company yet, but it's not IBM. It's not Facebook. Okay, it's not Apple. I hope I answered uh, your question. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed more questions there. Okay, let me just continue. Do you lose gainers and losers to find the stock? Yes, exactly. Exactly what I'm using. Okay, so where was I? What, what did I want to tell you? <laughs> we were at uh, intraday summer, right? Oh, yeah. I was trying to figure out. Okay, we talked about the entry point. The entry point was right over here, 35.50. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, shorting it at 35.50. And the next question for you is where would be my stop loss? Where's my stop loss? Do you have any number? I mean, just... Uh, Okay, let me put some lines here. This line is 36.50. I'll put another line, okay? Uh, the high of the day, 36.93. Approximately, okay? Uh, this reversal over here is 36.17. And I'll add another line. I want you to write down a number. If you didn't get my meaning, I want you to write down a number. Where would be your stop loss? Assuming you're going to short it under 35.50, where's your stop loss? Please write down a number. 
Uh, FIBO, you're looking from the point of the, from the low to the high of the recent move. So from 35.10 to 36.51. A cent over the high, write down the number. So here, the cent over the high, the high is 36.93. So if you want to write down cent over the high, that will be 36.94. So we've got some numbers here, 37, Jam, she says. Simon says 36.5. Uh, Afulu says 36 and a half, 36 and a half team, 36 says George, it's 36, 51 save you, I like the 51, I'm not saying in the right place, I'm just saying I like the one over the semi whole number, it's always very useful, that's the right point, so Mark, if you're writing 36, 50, always add another cent because the semi whole number could help you, 36, 50, always 36, 51 would be your stop. Uh, 3693 um, and uh, in YouTube 3660, 3651, 3690. Okay, now it has nothing to do with your risk reward. Let me start with that. You could base your risk reward after you decide where would be your stop loss point. Um, in my opinion, your stop loss point should be 3617. Do we have a winner? 36.17? 21. You're close, Big Tom. I, I would regard you as a winner. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're my winner. 36.21, he says. Because it's exactly the same. I mean, it's quite the same. 36.17. Okay, let me uh, uh, erase the lines here. I will just leave the line where I think stop should be. Oh, sorry. I wanted to, where's my entry point? So that's my entry point and my stop loss would be like one cent higher over here. Okay, so in, in my opinion, entry point uh, 35, uh, 50 and stop loss 36, 17. That makes it uh, 67 cent uh, stop loss or 68 or 70 percent stop loss or whatever. Why would this be my uh, stop loss? This would be my stop loss because the, this is in in um, because this is in in my opinion the point of no return. That's the point of no return. Hold on a second. Um, Okay, why would I call it the point of no return? I would call it the point of no return because uh, I just have to imagine that in my mind. Let's 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 do the uh, imagination game here, and I need you to be very very imaginative. I need you to imagine. You know, when you're a trader, it's not all about um, it's not all about uh, you know. Um, why did I paint this line now? It's not all about uh, the technicals. It's not all about technically speaking. It's a lot about your imagination. Seriously, it's a lot about a lot about your imagination. You move into a stock. The next thing you need to do is imagine the stop loss. And what do I mean about imagine the stop loss? Look at the point of your entry, and start thinking about the failure. Okay, so it moved down a bit, and then close to the lows, you didn't take your partial yet. It's stopped and started moving higher, started moving higher. Please imagine that. And I want you to think about the point in which the stock, as it moves higher in your imagination, as it moves higher, is at the point of no return. Think about the point where the stock is looking higher and it just, you just look at it at some point, at some price, and you say, goodness, it's not going to return. It's done with. It's, it's going to move higher now. That's, that's it. Finished. I'm lost. I, I'm, I'm, it's going to continue over the highs, or maybe it's going to close the gap, or whatever. Just look at that point. Try to imagine the point of no return. Of course, you could be wrong, but mostly you will be right. You know, I don't know if you play some kind of sports or you do uh, those different things that where, where, where you have to uh, activate your imagination. Like if you're playing golf, uh, you can't succeed in playing golf without imagining 
uh, the way the ball is going to move and land right into the hole. I mean, you imagine the way it flies. You imagine the way it gets when you, when, you, when you hit it. You just imagine where it goes. If you don't use your imagination, you will never be a good golf player. So when you're hitting the ball and you're imagining, and then your body follows and everything becomes very clear and very, uh, you know, uh, 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 intuitive. You, you just do what you think you're doing. So the imagination in trading is extremely important. It's not just technical. It's not that if you're a good math mathematician, you're going to succeed in, in trading. If you know about ec economic economics, you will succeed about in trading. In fact, I guarantee you, if that's the only thing you know, if you're great in mathematics or great in economics, I guarantee you that you're going to lose money. Okay, you, you need to use your imagination. Um, that's why I, I normally say that, uh, you know, trading is somewhere in between uh, exact science and art. Really, seriously, you need your artistic part. And your artistic part is really your imagination. I want you to start thinking, if the stock is moving higher, what will happen? What would be the point of no return? I want you to take a look at the chart, build the chart in your mind, watch the way it moves higher. And once it gets to that point, I want you to think, okay, so now it's a 36.17. Is there any chance it's going to come down now? If you're not sure, ask it. Seriously, ask the stock. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> you probably think I need to be hospitalized now. Seriously, I'm not joking. Just ask it. What do you want to do, ANF? What do you want to do? You were 36.17. I thought you were going to break down under those. What do you want to do? 36.17. And then ANF is going to think a little bit and it's going to tell you, well, tell you what, Mayor is going to tell me. I think I want to go up. 36.17. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not coming back down now. Not coming back down anymore. You see what I mean? Ask it. It's not going to answer. <laughs> Unless you really need to get hospitalized. But just imagine your answer. Just imagine what's going to happen once the stock gets to 36.17. If it gets there, it's just crying. I don't want to come back. Or maybe there will be a chance of 30% it will come back. Or 40% it will come back. It's good enough for you to exit the trade. When you get to the point of, in your imagination, no return, that's the point of your stop. Now, please forget about everything you've been taught with some, whoever taught you day trading. Stop over the highs. Stop at the reversal point. Uh, stop at the technical st stop. Sometimes it is a technical stop. I'm not saying it's not sometimes a technical stop. And sometimes it is over the high. Sometimes the point of no return, the point where ANF will tell you, I don't want to come back down, that will be the high. Just imagine the way it moves higher. Maybe it could have been near the high, but it's not in the case of ANF. Some other stocks it could be. And sometimes it's over the highs. So I want you to use your imagination and think, where is the point of no return? Just forget about high of the day, uh, five-minute reversals, and everything. It's, it's, sometimes it is there, okay? But it's, your, 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 your point of no return is what's important. Your imagination is what's important. Your in, intuition is what's important. Use your intuition if you're a trader. If you don't use your intuition, you're just not going to make it. You're just not going to make it. That's it. Okay, so that would be your stop loss. So if you have a 70 cent stop loss, where would be your target? We're not getting to a lesson of risk award here. We're not getting into this point right now. Uh, it depends on your risk award. Like if your risk award is one to one, then you need to think about 70 cent target. If your risk to award is one to two, then you need to... Uh, believe that it can do a little bit more. Actually, this one did one, two, three, depending on where's your stop. If you got the right stop, you can have an easier target. If, if you believe that 70 cents is the right stop loss, then your target, doesn't matter if it's one to one or one to two or one to three, is easier to reach. Your chance to succeed is, a bit, is better. I hope you got my meaning. Um, more questions here. To what point do you think the stock is going the wrong way? We just discussed that. Uh, if it was 36.50 for the specific trade, I would... Mm, okay. 
uh, we talked about it when mental is it good you think the stop loss or if it's level where things get worse for the trade that's exactly what we talked about uh, Hussein I believe I believe I answered your question uh, amen I would imagine formula formation using the first false candle first false candle you know again you uh, now look amen you're getting into very technical here you're looking okay the first false candle you see you, you're getting a little bit too technical for me here <laughs> you get my meaning uh, just imagine the point of no return in my opinion okay that's it uh, yesterday my server trade you think I remember I remember how I made $25,000 yesterday at zero seriously you think I remember that I wanted to ask uh, I'm just joking I wanted to ask you a question about your stop loss uh, well not now sorry I mean can go back to this one um, faster the failure but better the moving down yeah I guess it's all. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. How do you decide the size of your trade? Okay, uh, as I said earlier, um, PBRA, um, it has to do with um, market direction, for example. Does the market helps me? Uh, how big is the gap? Is it a 3% gap, 7% gap, 11% gap as ANF? Uh, in the case of ANF, I doubled down as it moved under the laws. I really love this trade and it worsted. it. So size of my trade, uh, it's, it, you know, it has to start somewhere. I mean, there's a, how much you can risk per trade and so on, and how much you can. Uh, I, I would normally suggest people to have a, a max loss sum. That would be your initial size. And then you could double down on that. So if you have a max loss of, let's say, $100, you're, uh, at some points, if you really, really like the trade, and I'm not getting into should you like this one or other one but it depends on the trade not all trades are created equally then uh, you could double down and that's exactly what i did today what causes gaps when the market uh, is closed um, most of the uh, most most of the announcements come pre-market or after market time adam so when the company has an announcement it will always do it pre-market time or after market so pre-market two hours before they just published their uh, annual report or something like that it will always be not during market hours unless some something comes out during market hours and they have to disclose it if you stopped out and it continues coming down would you re-enter Uziel good point uh, sometimes I do re-enter it happened to me yesterday Moderna I think uh, that would be rare that would be rare I, I could be if I'm stopped out and um, um, let's say I'm, I have a stop at 36.17 it moved up another two cents and then it came down yeah I could re I could enter but if it moves up higher than that I think I won't but again it depends on the trade the answer is yes I could uh, do you consider ATR yes ATR is very important Titan. Uh, you should be using ATR but you know when you look at ANF with a big gap down you look at the first few minutes you don't need the ATR you look at the chart you know the ATR you don't you don't really need it uh, sometimes when you're not sure definitely use the ATR how do you decide when to add to winning trades as I mentioned earlier some trades are just looking better much better uh, depends on the market direction depends on the trade depends on the how big is the gap depends on how the volume is so you need to come out with everything together uh, to me again it's very intuitive I, I watch the chart I watch the volume I don't even think about okay high volume okay uh, dodgy okay it's just embedded in my mind I'm trading for 21 years when I look at the chart when I look at the chart, I see the metrics. I'm not joking. I see the metrics. What well, you look at the chart and you look at uh, pin, you look at uh, uh, sorry, uh, buyers, sellers, bid ask, um, Fibonacci's, VWAPs, um, volume, and you start analyzing this. I don't. I see the metrics. Okay, I look at everything. It's like I don't. I don't have to analyze everything. It's just like I look at it and. <laughs> I know what's going on I'm not joking I'm not joking I'm serious about it I see the metrics and, and I'm not the only one I'm not the only one okay okay so um, 
Yeah, we talked about your target as well. There's one more example. I, I'm sorry if I didn't ask or uh, answer only your question. I'm terribly sorry, but we're probably not going to have the time for this. We have to end it sometime. So let me just move to uh, my last trade I want to discuss today, which is right. With a nice ride in right. And here is what happened. Uh, right was posted in the trading room. One of you guys posted it today. Uh, it wasn't my pick. I didn't see it pre-market time because I'm not watching stocks under $10. Sometimes it is a mistake. It's a very rare occasion where I would trade a stock uh, like right. It had 30 million shares in volume where I moved in. Uh, it was posted in the room where it was approximately at 7, then popped up to the highs and then pulled back. And I said, well, you know, I already have three winners. How about risking my money with another one? So I posted it in, in the room for a long over 705, if I remember correctly. And then we moved in right over here. And wow, look at that huge move up. So what, what the, the issue is with right is exactly the opposite. I we talked about earlier with about stocks which are gapping, uh, which are gapping down. Um, uh, which are gapping down in a big way and then continue to come down. That's a gap and go. Now we're talking about a gap and go long, which is exactly the same idea. Just the stock starts with a big gap up. This one over 20%. The bigger, the better. Start with a big gap up and then it moves up and then the sellers start coming in, profit taking, whatever. Again, I'm not going to analyze everything, but just remember this. You look for a technical formation. So if a stock just moves up and up and up and up and up, you're not joining it. And there's several stocks that behave this way. Okay? You just don't join something that looks like that. And then it continue to come up. You don't have a technical formation to go long. Then you wait for the sellers to come. And then they come. And then they give you some kind of a reversal technical reversal probably we could have moved in a little bit earlier but you know it was just posted in the room when it was around here 712 so anyway uh waiting for a reversal going long and that's exactly the opposite it just goes higher now please understand these big moves gap and goes are not initiated by institutional traders they are not they will not be in a trade that moves from 660 to 770 they are not there they are not playing this game this game is for uh, traders for investors for people like us for people who appreciate the volatility who appreciate the trend it's it's it, Institutional traders cannot participate in that because it's moving too fast for them. It's it, they, they cannot participate. They need to wait for a pullback, buy, get commission. It goes up. Some of them are selling. Some of them are buying. They're not getting into the crazy games. And again, it popped up more than 3%. So it's on hold. So now they're having a meeting uh, in a day, in a week, in a month, whenever. So they're not in the game. It's mainly about us. And when stock is moving up that way, just think what happened to GME, to AMC, to Tesla, whatever. Just think about what happens when greed kicks in. It's not as good as fear. I, I, I personally um, would short more gap and goes and go long. That's why I had three gap and go shorts today and one gap and go long today. So, you know, that's, that's, really, uh, that's really the way I trade. I, I, I really personally prefer, uh, I really personally prefer to go for the um uh for the um sorry for the um gap and go short sorry um if you're wondering how i finished today if you didn't see my uh recap when we started trading today uh here's all of my trades today uh three of them are for the short side and one of them is for the long ride i also had some ride some quantity riding after closed when I closed the trading session today, I was up 27 grand and it continued to ride some of them and just finished $32,000 uh, in profit today. Gap and go strategy. All of this is just gap and go strategy. And you're looking at my numbers and, you, and, and you're probably saying, wow, that's huge. Uh, please remember, uh, trading is hard. It's not as simple as it looks. I'm very experienced. Um, my results are not typical. Uh, and, you know, but even having... Tenth of what I did today is three, still is three grand. And having one hundredth of what I did today with extremely low size, it still is three hundred dollars. And who makes three hundred dollars in 30 minutes? I made 
30 grand in 30 minutes, but $300 in 30 minutes, if you're taking it with extremely low size compared to mine, that should be a good day, right? That should be a good day. So again, forget about my results. Just look at uh, the fact that uh, there's a 100% uh, I had today, 100% today, it doesn't often, often come this way. I mean, my average is 68%. Today I had 100. A good day. Exceptionally good day. Uh, yeah, I use a lot of uh, leverage. I, I definitely use a lot of leverage. Um, I'm very experienced. I just don't need uh, all of my cash to be in my account. So I, I use a lot of leverage. Again, not something that you guys should do. How long did it take me to become profitable? It took me approximately two years to start earning money, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And then when I say starting earning money, it doesn't mean I was making more than minimum wage. I, I stopped losing money and started earning money at approximately two years, but until it became something interesting, it probably was over three years. Um, Yeah, long is greed, short is fear. Absolutely. That would be the best. Well, traders, um, sorry I couldn't answer all of your questions, but I really enjoyed this uh, webinar and I hope you did too. Uh, it took a little bit more than I expected, so I, I appreciate the fact that you were still here with me and didn't fall asleep. <laughs> I hope it was interesting. So, uh, thank you guys for participating. Uh, it was really nice uh, to have you around. And um, let's do it more. And um, have a good night, have a good day, and I'll see you all in the trading room tomorrow. Thank you for participating again. And if you're on YouTube and you didn't give us a thumb up, that's the time, I guess, right? I mean, did we earn it today? Please do that. Thank you, guys. Bye. Sure do appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you so much. Great lesson today. Thanks, Scott. Thank you to everybody on YouTube. As Mayor said, thanks for smashing that thumbs up button. We appreciate you and uh, look forward to trading with you tomorrow. I had a nice profitable day today. Tomorrow's a Friday. Looking in on the weekend, we look to deliver more of these here as we grow the channel. So thank you again, everybody, for attending. Thank you for everybody here in the room. And uh, we'll have a great night tonight. Look forward to seeing everybody in the morning. Good night, everybody. Thank you to Mayor and the rest of the